Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie Diaz. I'm a senior at Boston Land Academy, and I'm here to talk to you about my stepdad. Manuel first came to the United States in the early 1990s. He wanted his children to grow up in the land of opportunity like most immigrant parents do. Jobs were hard to come by, and he had no choice but to sell drugs. This in no way reflects badly on his character. It was just the only way he could provide for his family. In a short two weeks, he was caught and sent back to his homeland, the Dominican Republic. This was his first deportation. A little while later, he tried to come in through Florida, only to be caught once again and sent back his second. And finally, a few years ago, he successfully made it in through the Mexican-American border and made his way up to Boston. He wanted to live his life the right way. He didn't want to live in fear or hide in the shadows. He did want to spend time with his kids and find jobs. I don't think I was ready for him to enter my life, nor did I think he expected to meet my mom. But when he did, it was love at first sight. He was just some random stranger sitting on my couch when I got home from school one day, and he quickly became my stepdad with absolutely no pushback from my siblings and I. We were just so happy to see my mom in love again, something we never saw when she was with our father. Growing up, I had no clue what it was like to even have a father figure at a birthday party. My own father wouldn't come to my quinceañera, but Manuel was there. I remember not wanting to make a big fuss of my birthday, because I didn't think 15 was that big of a milestone, but I did it anyway. I invited my closest friends, and they were just so excited to meet Manuel. The only thing I can regret from that night was not having the courage to get up there and dance the traditional father-daughter dance with Manuel. My sister did not have that same opportunity as I did. By then, he was already gone. On January 4th, 2017, Manuel was on his way home from work when he was pulled over for a broken taillight. He couldn't provide a real ID and was arrested. I always knew he was at risk of getting caught, but not once did I think it would happen to us. We had no idea where he was or if he was even safe. And yet, I was still expected to go to school that next day and act like everything was OK. I looked down at my shoes as I walked in the hallways, not caring about who I bumped into, calling his phone frantically in the three-minute periods we have in between classes, but not getting an answer. Where do I even begin with Manuel? He truly sets the bar pretty high as a father figure, but I'm pretty biased. He's really the only one I have. He has cared about us since the very beginning, since even before he knew my name. I remember a week after he met my mom, he picked me up from school when I was sick and basically nursed me back to health. He even risked losing one of his jobs, which he, he was working three at the time, just to pick up some ginger ale for me so he could make sure I was healthy by the time he came home. He cooked dinner for us every Friday night, usually hamburgers, and then we would sit together and watch a Celtics game. I have not watched a Celtics game since he's been gone. Sometimes, he just made random quiches because they were his favorite and his best dish to make. He only wanted the best for us. He was the first father figure that I had seriously started depending on, and it hurt so much to lose him. After they threw him in jail, I remember that there were times we couldn't hear from him when they were moving him from facility to facility. He went from Boston to Rhode Island, back to Boston, and then to Louisiana, where he was finally deported for hopefully the last time. One time, they even threw him in solitary confinement, which I can only attribute to the overcrowdment of jails. I later found out that the inmates at that jail called solitary confinement the hole, because not many make it out of it. I can't imagine what that did to him psychologically, because it hurt me. It destroyed me. In that week that he was in solitary confinement, those were three visits that I couldn't go to, three phone calls we couldn't have, three times he couldn't bang on his window from when we were leaving the jail just to let us know that he was looking over us, three I love yous we couldn't say. I know it, I reference him like he's dead as I'm speaking in the past tense, but I, I couldn't help but feeling this way until April of this year. We had to make an emergency trip to the Dominican Republic when his mother, my grandmother, passed away. 
We could barely afford the trip as it is. I had to dip into my college savings just to pay for my ticket. I can remember touching down in that airport knowing that every step I took would bring me to him the first time I would see him in a, a year and a couple months. And the second that my eyes caught sight of him, I dropped everything and ran to him, and he almost fell over as my siblings ran behind me. Everything I had to repress for that year came out, and despite the circumstances, I just felt so happy to have him in my arms. In that short week that we were together, we were conjoined at the hip. I didn't pass up a single opportunity to be near him. Even if he was tending to his yard that he is so proud of, I would just watch him cut, cut down the rotten mangoes or the branches that make a certain tree look ugly, because I know that there would come a time where I wouldn't be able to see him face to face. And even though we can't FaceTime 24 hours a day, unfortunately, I know he is alive. This morning, in fact, he sent me the best good morning text wishing me good luck today, and he hopes to watch this video later on tonight when he gets home from work. And every day, he sends me such a cute good morning text that will get me through a day, that will give me a reason to stay awake in the middle of a boring math test. One positive memory that I can hold on to was when he was in in a federal facility in Louisiana while Hurricane Harvey was raging on outside. He told us that the prison was flooding because they weren't, they weren't protecting the inmates. But even then, that night my mom got home from work and it was just a regular Thursday night. I was making her dinner when a random phone call came in, or a video call. She didn't know who it was from, but all I said it was from Louisiana, so I urged her to pick it up. Then, three men in inmates' uniforms were on the camera, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I just knew Manuel was somewhere in that room, and I just wanted them to pass the phone to him. He quickly introduced us to the friends he had made in the, quick sh in the short two days that he was there. And then we talked to him. I thought it was hilarious that they got away with a cell phone in a federal facility, <laughs> and they got away with an exceptionally long phone call. And despite the thousands of miles that he was from our house, he was in my kitchen. It didn't feel like when we went to visit him and there was a glass wall in between us that I couldn't hug him because he was a dangerous person. He was in my house. For so long, I was mad. I didn't really know what I was mad at until I was asked to do this talk. I realized I was mad at the judge who didn't seem to care about what happened to him and didn't see him as a person at all. I was mad at the system for dehumanizing all undocumented immigrants. I was mad at the administration as they were awaiting their inauguration at the time. I was mad at that lawyer that laughed when Manuel said he had to leave school in the fourth grade to support his family. I was mad at myself for letting myself feel powerless when it was us against the system. This story is almost never listened to. It enters the news cycle and ent exits it just as quickly. I wanted to be in a place where I was heard and where I was listened to and I could make a change. I started by joining the student immigration movement at my school, where I met so many friends that were dedicated to preventing this from happening to another family like mine. And that's where I met my friend Jupiter. Jupiter pull pull pulled me aside after I had told the club what happened to my family and, strongly, and very strongly opened up to me. He told me that he was here for my family and that he was here for me, anything I ever needed, despite the fact that he couldn't understand what I was going through. And I know he still is because he's with me today. He gave me that courage I needed to advocate for myself that had to be my, heart, the, my biggest fear when I was in the 10th grade. With this newfound courage, I reached out to the Stepping Stone Foundation they're this, gr this great source of amazing opportunities for me, including this one where I'm at right now. They put me through to a law firm that they're partnered with, and that's where we found his lawyer that's been dedicated to him since day one. Because of Stepping Stone, I even further opened up, and despite the circumstances that I was living with, I had become a better person. Let me put something out there. I was 16 years old when this happened to my family. I was in the 10th grade. I was meant to worry about my AP bio class and my social life, but instead I had to become something that I didn't have to be for a long time, a grown-up. Realizing that took away so many things from me. 
I didn't get to hang out with my friends after school because I had to help go visit my stepdad after school. And I, I didn't feel like I was giving much up, but it hurt. I know that many people in this room have experienced the fear of deportation or have li lived through the aftermath of a loved one's deportation, and I'm here for you. It's a pain that, for those of you who haven't, I hope you never have to go through to have your family ripped away from you. Your only form of solace, the only person I could talk to. My family can't understand my passion for social justice. Why I would get up here in front of you and tell you such a private and personal part of my life, when if it were them, they would keep it to themselves. Can you imagine what children who are separated from their parents at the border go through? Because they are their, their parents' only source of translation and solace what it is like for them to have every aspect of their being scrutinized before they can even understand their own names. If I couldn't do it at 16, I'm 100% sure they, couldn't, they can't do it now. Now, more than ever, it is especially important for us to educate on ourselves on what is happening around us and advocate for change, advocate for our families, our loved ones, our fellow Americans. Because if we do not, I can't stand to watch someone else have their manual taken away from them. Something as little as signing a petition, as sharing my story, because this story was not meant for it to go in one ear and out the other. I need you to remember this story, to process what happened to me, even if you can't understand it yet, and share it, because I have to bear this burden until I can be in Manuel's arms permanently. Signing the petitions, voting, which was just one of the most important midterm elections that passed, it can go a long way in helping someone's situation, even if change won't come for a long time, because I know it would have helped me to have someone there behind me. We have people with post postcards that you can fill out, that you can send to your representatives and tell them how, how passionate you are about immigration reform, because I need to have something big to tell Manuel the next time I see him. Thank you.